It reached out to Chief Magistrate Margie Livingston for comment on this story, but did not hear back. Wednesday, called again, same story, did not hear back. So I came out to her actual office. The council agenda for tonight, and nowhere on it is any mention of Bike Fest, the governor, or anything like that. So regardless of if there is a statement tonight, I plan to speak to Mayor Jake Evans one-on-one -on -one and get his remarks after the governor has called for an end to bike fest. You can but we're not actively seeking annexation for that area or in the north area at this point. Now that's kind of where I get confused. Help me to understand that. Um, if you send a letter for annexation to one neighborhood, how is that, I guess, not actively pursuing annexation? Through my research, I found that some firefighters were earning double their salary in overtime. So I sat down with county officials and I asked them, Exactly how do you validate these numbers? The rainwater pipes on the beach, it's not terribly attractive. It is still just rainwater, though, that needs to go someplace. The Department of Health and Environmental Control says otherwise. After the story was already completed, I heard from City of Myrtle Beach officials telling me that Lanier Parking Solutions was working on the bad address issue and would have a response to me soon. Someone misspoke on one end and someone misinterpreted it on another. Basically, how, did, how does this confusion happen? Well, I can't. I can't answer that. From that perspective, it really looks like, well, here's the head coach. He's going to bring two of his coaching yeah. staff down. But to that you say. Okay. Yeah, Bob, now when you're in need of medical service, Horry County EMS will be there in minutes flat. But it's not a free service. Medical transportation comes with a cost. A cost that many don't pay and leave Horry County Fire Rescue holding the bill. Now in a lot of cases, there's nothing Horry County can do to get that money back. When a call comes in, Horry County Fire Rescue go out expecting to save every life. When the bills go out, the county does not have the same expectations. We do not budget based on 100% of billings, but not everybody pays all their bills. $887.30. While EMS does everything they can to help you, there's only so much the county can do to collect. Right now, there, there is no other option for out-of-state collections when they go delinquent. In 2014, Horry County Council wrote off more than $5 million worth of uncollected EMS charges for the year of 2011. In fact, from 2004 to 2011, more than $21 million has been written off. It's not from a lack of trying. This is our mail out for the week. Uh, about 2,000 bills in here. With the cost of paper and stamps, mailing can get expensive. About $1,000 worth of mailings to go out right here. The return would be worth the investment. The bill, which could be 300 to 3,000, who knows. Unfortunately, a lot of those bills will come right back to the county. This is boxes of mail that's been returned, okay. undeliverable for some reason. Horry County Fire Rescue Deputy Chief Scott Thompson says, in total, about 10% of the bills come back. This stack of boxes with thousands of letters are over a three-week time span. He says some of the reasons they come back are hard to believe. They weren't deceased, so those things happen. Thompson says in total, five attempts will be made to bill EMS patients over a 140-day period. After that, if you live in the state, the money could be withheld from your tax return. However, this is Myrtle Beach, and there are a lot of out-of-state visitors who use the county's EMS services. We really don't have the resources in-house to, to reach out to those states outside our South Carolina's borders. That means if you live outside of South Carolina, there's absolutely no repercussions not paying your EMS bill. While the county continues to provide a service saving lives, millions of dollars sit uncollected because they don't have the resources. But the county is looking to change that a third party vendor to actually do the billings and collections for us. Their resources is a, so much larger than what we have with five individuals doing that exact same process. Requests have gone out to bring in a company that would be able to pick up the slack. And I'll pay more when I can. It would cost no money to taxpayers and instead the third party company would make their profits off of money they are able to collect. Right now it's still up for debate and dollars are still going uncollected. Soon that may change and help millions of dollars come back into the county's pocket and in turn, save you. Now, Horry County spokesperson Lisa Borsier told me the county is still reviewing proposals from third-party billing companies. And if they do decide to hire a third-party billing company, Borsier says no current staff will be fired. Live in the studio, I'm AJ Janivel for News 13. Megan, South Carolina has laws in place to protect all of us, but appears the law wasn't followed in this case.
A South Carolina code put into effect April 7, 2014 says the magistrate court cannot grant bond for a violent crime to someone already out on bond for a violent crime. Records show that's exactly what happened. Within three months, Shuler was charged with criminal sexual conduct with a minor twice. Both charges considered violent crimes in South Carolina. Horry County Associate Chief Magistrate Aaron Butler is the judge who granted Shuler bond both times. Solicitor Jimmy Richardson tells me that Magistrate Butler would have known Shuler's past. With regard to all bond settings, it is incumbent upon a magistrate, actually um, through state law, that they must look at an NCIC or a rap sheet. Mm -hmm. So they would see if uh, not only is the person been charged, uh, convicted of another crime, but even if they've been charged with another crime. I wanted to see exactly why Bond was granted the second time to Shuler. On Tuesday, I reached out to Chief Magistrate Margie Livingston for comment on this story, but did not hear back. Wednesday, called again, same story, did not hear back. So I came out to her actual office. I was told by the people who work in the office that she had left for the day. I also reached out to Associate Chief Magistrate Aaron Butler the judge who was on the case and set bond for Paul Schuler, He told me that he would not comment. The law was relatively new when Schuler was let out of jail the second time, so there might have been a mistake. In the most recent rape charge, the magistrate court has not granted bond to Schuler due to the law, though he could get bond through a circuit court judge. Right now, Schuler is still in jail. He was supposed to be in court last May for the first rape charge. However, the circuit judge allowed the trial to be postponed at the request of Schuler's defense attorney. In the case, it was Heather Von Herman. I reached out to her for comment, but no one called me back. Live in the studio, I'm AJ Janivel for News 13. Special report, AJ. Five law enforcement tell me after every effort has been exhausted, a warrant is filed away and considered unable to locate. In a lot of cases, deputies know exactly where the wanted person is and are unable to make an arrest due to legal restrictions. And that person gets off scot-free. Over the last several months, I've found out why so many people wanted for crimes here in Horry County are still on the loose. Try to attempt to locate some of these uh, people that have warrants on them. Whether it be successful or not is a different story. Right now, Deputy Chris Palmer has 65 active warrants he's pursuing. That number is always changing. I've gained, uh, I think, about 20 yesterday. Palmer will go door to door throughout the county looking for people who are wanted. It's a hit and miss. Uh, I've had days where I served up to 10. Uh, some days back that I served but one or two. A lot of criminals know how to avoid the police when they're wanted. Hopefully, we'll, they'll slip and we'll be there to catch them. Deputies have resources and tools to locate these criminals, but there are only so many times they can visit someone's home or job. And after a while, the warrants that aren't found will be sent here. Stacked by the thousands are warrants that have been labeled unable to locate. You hear UTL, unable to locate. Um, that doesn't mean that warrant's going away. I mean, it's still active and it's going to remain active until it's cleared. The Sheriff's Department tells us at the most recent count, there were 16,248 active warrants filed away. Who are these people and what are their crimes? I requested several times a list of all active warrants, including UTLs from the Sheriff's Department. However, they told me my request was impossible to fill due to privacy issues. But through the solicitor's office, I was able to obtain every single bench warrant that is currently active throughout the entire county. A bench warrant is for someone who skipped their court date, but the 22-page document from the solicitor's office also included the original crimes they were wanted for. There were more than a thousand crimes listed. Most are misdemeanors, but some are felonies like assault, robbery, arson, and even attempted murder. We feel bad for these, these individuals that uh, go years without having justice for the warrant that's out there, you know, in their name. So what is stopping law enforcement from making arrests when they know exactly where the offenders are? A lot of times, it's the cost. It's simply not economically feasible for the county to be able to extradite 16,000 people. It's not law enforcement that makes the decision. It all boils down to does the solicitor, will the solicitor approve us to go across state lines to get them if they get stopped? So I sat down with Horry County Solicitor Jimmy Richardson and asked when is the county willing to go after these people who commit crimes here and escape justice simply by driving a few hundred miles away. There's really no perfect system. Richardson says each warrant is taken on a case-by-case -case basis. He says the county will not invest money into extradition when it costs more to taxpayers than the actual crime. Of course, if they found someone wanted for kidnapping or murder or uh, rape or anything really bad, mm -hmm. we would uh, extradite 
from anywhere in the nation. And they've done so in the past. In 2009, Bruce Olin Underwood was charged with murder. He then fled the state. Horry County spent more than $2,000 to extradite Underwood back to the county. He was sentenced to 22 years without parole. Even with the amount of warrants the Sheriff's Department is able to bring in, the total number is hard to bring down. We're getting 30, 40, 50, 60 warrants a day. The deputies have served a lot of warrants in the past few years. Um, so, you know, we, uh, we, we, you know, they're out here working hard. Back in service code in. And for deputies on the street like Palmer, they keep at it, regardless of how many warrants are active. I'll end up getting some of them, but which ones is hard to say. And some of the warrants that have been labeled UTL date back decades. Sergeant Benton tells me the department was able to remove more than 2,100 warrants from the filing room because of this. He says once a warrant hits 10 years, it is sent back to the magistrate's office. In 2014, nearly 400 warrants were removed because of the fact that they were 10 years older. He says in some cases, the people on these warrants are not even still alive. The most recent count of warrants served here in Horry County for the month of January is 395. Live here in the studio, I'm AJ Janival for News 13. Now, Bob, the report I requested from the police department states the suspect, who was still in a coma three weeks later, had a previous record of selling crack cocaine. So I asked law enforcement how something like this could happen. In my 18 years here, I've never seen anybody uh, try to swallow a whole ounce of, of cocaine. The police report says Officer Stephen Rue pulled over the suspect for a suspended license. The report says Officer Rue searched the suspect and found a small bag of what appeared to be crack cocaine. And that is all the report states the officer found during his search. And we don't know exactly when he swallowed this. He could have swallowed it before he pulled over. Lieutenant Raul Dennis with the Horry County Police Department says the officer placed the suspect under arrest and had no idea there was any issue until they were both in the car. And on the way to the jail, he says, I can't breathe. I swallowed a bunch of cocaine. Lieutenant Dennis tells me Officer Rue pulled over immediately, called EMS, and tried to assist in any way possible. But Horry County Police are not trained in medical care. Even that fast, that individual was already unconscious and, and you know, not breathing very well. Lieutenant Dennis tells me medics got the bag out of the suspect's throat and retrieved 19 and a half grams of crack with an estimated value of about $2,000. The bag was open when medics pulled it out and Lieutenant Dennis says he is not sure if or how much of the drug the suspect swallowed. Dennis says it is a unique situation and he is confident in how his officer responded. Procedurally, I don't think that there was anything that could have been done differently in that case. Because the suspect is still in a coma, no charges have been filed yet, and his identity has not been released. Lieutenant Dennis tells me if the suspect does die, Horry County Police or SLED will investigate. Tonight, I also uh, requested the any dash cam video from this event. When we get more information, you can count on updates live here in the studio. I'm AJ Janova for News 13. In Horry County Schools, high school coaches are also required to be members of the faculty, meaning all of these coaches also got teaching jobs at the school. In response to our viewers' calls questioning four football coaches from the same area, all getting jobs at Carolina Forest, we investigated the situation and sat down with Carolina Forest's principal to find out what happened. From that perspective, it really looks like, well, here's a head coach. He's going to bring two of his coaching yeah. staff down. But to that you say? We, we had openings and we interviewed and they were qualified or highly qualified and certified teachers that we felt could give a good education or instruction to our students. Gay Driggers is the principal for Carolina Forest High School. Driggers is the one who made the final recommendation to hire Kenneth Shoemaker and Travis Gaster, head coach Mark Morris's assistant coaches from Cleveland High School, as well as Shane Dular, another head coach from the same division in North Carolina. Driggers says interviewing coaches ask constantly if there will be positions for members of their staff. You try to to, to help those, that coach if you can. Uh, but I was very upfront with anybody that we interviewed that I didn't know if I would be, help, be able to help them with any assistant coaches at all. Driggers says no positions were created for Dular or Shoemaker to come to Carolina Forest. Instead, she says the coaches filled what Horry County school officials call critical needs positions, math and special education. They were, you know, certified and uh, also highly qualified in those areas. And so I made a recommendation to the school district um, for hire because we had those two positions open. The two positions filled by Dular and Shoemaker were first posted during the spring of 2013. And interviews were conducted into the summer. 
According to the Horry County School District, no candidates were hired, and instead, long-term certified substitutes were used for both openings. It's been difficult to find certified, highly qualified. Uh, our school district not only requires you to be certified, but they want you to be highly qualified as well. According to the numbers News 13 obtained, it certainly seems so. For the math opening, 28 applicants applied. Dular was the only person interviewed. For the special education opening, there were 49 applicants. And Shoemaker was the only person interviewed. I requested resume copies of the people who applied for both positions. However, school officials refused due to privacy issues. Drigger says her top priority is finding a teacher first, but says extracurriculars play a big part in the final decision-making process. If I have a, a candidate that is a track coach or a candidate happens to be, look, I've been working with robotics or we the people or anything like that, then those are things I'm looking for because I want to make sure that I'm giving every opportunity to the students on this campus possible. Drigger says, according to Shoemaker and Dular's references, the two were qualified teachers. She says the fact they were both coaches in multiple sports added to their qualifications. Drigger says the most important thing she considers when hiring is what the candidate will bring to the students. I spoke to head coach Mark Morris about the hirings. However, he would not speak on camera or comment about the issue. For more information on the story or to voice your thoughts on the hirings, go to WBTW.com. In the studio, A.J. Janivel for News 13.